Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to our Saturday morning Bible study. Today is Saturday, June 23rd, 2018, and we are recording from the Plainfield Christian Science Church, Plainfield, New Jersey, the United States of America. And uh, we welcome you all. And this morning, our moderator is Jeremy from New Jersey. Good morning. Our quote today is from Miscellaneous Articles by Bicknell Young. This cannot be said too often. It is that which the Bible has said all through the centuries. Quote, love is the fulfilling of the law, end quote, from Romans 11.10. When love is demonstrated, or in the measure that it is, there is no sensitiveness. We cannot be hurt. Neither can we hurt anyone else. It does not do any good to be severe, especially when we are convinced that the other party is just as honest in his conviction as we are in ours. Our work is to educate, and the Bible states that in order to do that, we must bear one another's burden. It takes long years of patient perseverance to bring about a desirable change in some instances. And generally speaking, the change must occur first in ourselves. Thank you. Very wise counsel. Uh, I, the reason I ended up going for that quote was because when I first was reading in the lesson about the scribes, I was sort of annoyed with them. <laughs> but then I thought that, you know, this, this works well because they were just as honest in their convictions as the disciples were <laughs> to herself. They just needed to be educated. Good counsel for all of us, I'm mainly including myself in this, that when love is demonstrated, there's no sensitiveness. It goes on to say that we cannot be hurt. So if I feel like I've been hurt by something, I have to ask myself, well, to what extent am I really the expression of love here? Because if I really were, so, you know, this hurt wouldn't happen. What always gets hurt is pride. So if you're hurt, it means you've got pride. And that's what needs to be eliminated. I also like that the change must first occur in ourselves because it's like our own view that we have to change in, our, in you know, the wrong thoughts to the right thoughts and not fall with the mesmeric view. We can't also forget that maybe once we were, uh, we misunderstood also. So that's why I think it's a beautiful counsel to, to not be so severe in certain times and bear another's burden. See that you were there once also, so you can help someone. Yeah, and I guess it's even possible that I'm still there at times. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that Jesus was so compassionate. I know Benjamin had mentioned that in his testimony, and that was the thing. I mean, he came down from the mountain, and he was so compassionate. He put his understanding into to you know use to help everyone and it's such a good example for us and I think Mrs. Eddy has said that um, rebukes and compassion are the same thing uh, it takes it takes compassion to rebuke and yes he was very loving but he could also be very strong and stern when needed. Mm -hmm. This is the severity without the love that it's talking about. Rebuking with the love will be felt, I'm sure. And 
what makes the and what justifies the difference here? But what makes what what is it that requires a rebuke? Uh, like a personal yeah. sense, as opposed to you know being one with God, having a personal view. If I feel something is sensitive, when is it appropriate to rebuke? When it's a sense against God. Thank you. If I feel personally offended, my pride has been hurt, and I better keep my mouth shut and love more. But if the offense is to God, that needs to be rebuked. And that is love, and that is the fulfilling of the law. I think another point uh, that, Jeremy, you just read, you know, like everyone is so convinced in what they believe in, so it's that desire to share what you found is true and know that God is all working to bring whoever's conviction in whatever the miseducation might be. It, it, the truth is doing the work as well. So it's not a personal, I'm going to convince you of something that I know, but, you know, it's truth working. You can rely on that. Very important, and you're always speaking to another child of God who has who has all the ability and capacity to know God, and it's because if you treat him like he's an inferior, well, then you will set the battle in array because it's not the truth. He's not an inferior. And what is it that usually convinces people of the truth? Well, I, I was ready to be convinced of the truth when I had suffered enough with my false beliefs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, most people are convinced when they see that the truth actually does something good for them. <laughs> or when they see that it does something good for others. And it's, and it's explained that it's the truth that has done something good. That's why our testimony meetings are so educational. Right? Yeah. Yes. Certainly. Yeah. yeah. When we can, we, we can talk about how the truth has actually done something for us, that makes a huge impression on people. Nothing beats results. Yeah, and can we really understand something until we've proven it to ourselves? Well, I know I can't. So. No, I can't either. <laughs> <laughs> That's why this education is not an intellectual exercise. Isn't that the difference between the idealism and realism? You know, to have the, to study and have the ideal thought, but not really putting it into practice. Well, if you don't, it's good to study, yeah. But if you don't put it into practice, you haven't made it yours. And to spout the truth without having proven it to yourself, not likely to have a positive impact on anybody else. I love the article on the homepage, The Questions of My Friend, by Catherine Yates. I think that kind of speaks to what we're talking about here. How a person was saying Christian science is good, but... 
and they try to overcome something by not using it, but by just stopping um, medication or whatever it was. I don't remember it right offhand now, but it was a great, great article on how Christian science works and how we have the responsibility to use it or lose it. Yeah, thank you, Carson, sent us that one. So we're very grateful for all these contributions people find. So are we ready to move on, Jeremy? Definitely. Well, today's topic is, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. And the first question is, at what point in Christ Jesus' ministry did these events take place? It was after Jesus' transfiguration on the mount, and it was not long before his crucifixion. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so he already had a reputation by now. He healed a lot of people. He had taught a lot. His disciples had had the benefit of quite a bit of time with him. That also made me think about the scribes, what was going on down uh, when he came down from the mount was that if this wasn't far from the crucifixion, then it's probably really heated up and the wicked malice is probably very stirred up at this point also. It's interesting that he meets this child who has such a severe case of this violent um, behavior. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's almost the more good deeds, the more good he does, the more the carnal mind is enraged. And so it still is. That's why I, I tend to look if someone is gendering a lot of hate. Uh, I tend to look carefully as to what that's about because sometimes it's just the, the human mind is just enraged. And a, a lot of the accusations are totally false. And we have someone who contacts our church time to time who has studied a, a lot of Augusta Stetson and feels quite strongly that she was a, a definite disciple of Mrs. Eddy and did not deserve the treatment that she was given. And... Uh, and, of course, we see it in the movement, all these that are excommunicated. What did they do? Engender that. If when the human mind is in so-called control, it never really is in control, but it, it hates. Anywhere it sees the Christ, it hates because it's a threat. The threat to them. And uh, so we, we, watch, we watch it for today certainly saw it was Christ Jesus here. He was doing one healing after the, another. He just did have a transfiguration, as Dale said, and uh, yet the hatred was directed at him. Uh, Linda and I were, were marveling last weekend how this story takes place right after uh, Jesus took those three disciples up to the mountain from last week's uh, lesson. So it's always, it's always very interesting to me and fascinating how the lessons build on each other. Grateful for that. Very true. It is true. I was looking at it as so, well. Yeah, that's, because last week I read something from Spurgeon about it. He said that um, our Lord had been on the mountain and had been transfigured. And when he came down, the first person that he met was the devil with whom he had to come in contact. Whenever you or I get up on the mountaintop and have a very happy and delightful experience, 
<laughs> we, we may expect to be in a battle before long. Our joy is, however, a preparation for the conflict. It nerves our spirit and makes us strong to meet the great enemy of our souls. I thought all that. That is beautiful. You put, put that on the forum, Lauren. Okay. okay. Boy, is that ever true. Mm-hmm. Even within ourselves. I mean, I, I remember some time when I thought, oh, wow, this great idea. And then, boom, something comes up. <laughs> it's as if it throws you right down. <laughs> so it is extremely practical in our own experiences, I think. You know, it was something we were taught here always, the protector demonstration. Certainly any time we had even a class, um, you would go home and maybe your, someone in your family hadn't been there and uh, would start a fight or all, all kinds of things mm-hmm. would happen. It was also true, you know, we didn't talk about it much, but the come to Plainfield day, uh, after you went home, you had to make sure you protected what you learned and your time here, or, or Arrow would just be waiting for you to try to take it all away. And uh, that's how it works. So, very true. After, after you've been to the mountaintop, make sure you are very much aware of, of the devil waiting to greet you and don't let him trip you up. But on the positive side, when you have been to the mountaintop, you're better prepared for things than you were before you went up. Yeah, that's and what it is. Yeah, and so you know we should we should expect that we will be tested as we grow to prove what we have prove what we have learned. Well, and that that's the that's the thing of it, and of course with. Christ Jesus, he had proved it. Um, But that's why if you had a a wonderful experience, you do need to nurture it and make sure you have proved it and are proving it before you just throw it out there uh, or something would try to take it away. So we're on, on guard, always on guard. Oh, it seems like when you've had an improvement in something and then it seems like it gets worse, it's like, okay, what's going on here? The the point of not being alarmed, not being afraid, remembering the faith you had, in what did the healing is so important, I think, because when you get alarmed by the picture, it's like, see if, oh, here, I'm, here I am again. Well, what are you going to do about it? You never got any healing or something like that. All the wrong things that we hear from the nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I was going to give it this past week, but I'll probably give it next week as a testimony where Mrs. Eddie says it's, if something comes back again or seems to reoccur, you you just treat it again, and and you keep treating it until it finally disappears. It will weaken in form if you do this faithfully, but not to be discouraged by it. Um, and that wonderful watching point we've had about the leaves falling always seems like you're brushing away the same leaves, but it's not the same leaves. You've got a new batch every day to brush away. So... Each time we're learning more, growing stronger, just be firm and be faithful, as the hymn goes. Forget not the right. And I think Mary's point is said a little differently. It's when when we have had a, a, a great experience, an enlightening experience, a growing experience, that's not the time to to um, relax. <laughs> or think that everything's okay now so I can relax. That's the time to be even more vigilant and and more alert. Yeah, in your faith. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. 
there can be a tendency to say, "Oh, wow, it's so great! I, you know, I've got, I've got it now." <laughs> <laughs> I've arrived. Yeah, I've arrived, and boy, did I have a great time and wanted to talk about it to everybody. But you no, know, keep your own counsel. And to acknowledge that God is in control of everything all the time. Um, it was mentioned. It was just mentioned how one build it, one lesson builds on the other <clears throat> in our lesson sermons, and um, it's been so wonderful to see that that they do that, and they're not writ- they're not written in that order. They're written sometimes the later lesson is written before the other one. So God's hand is all is on this work, on this growth, and on our learning. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, Dale. That's right. And they're written by different people. Yeah. And then no one else really has any idea. I mean, there's never any planning in that regard. It, it's just all demonstration, as we call it. God, God unfolding his plan for his people. Jeremy, did you want to say something about the question? Uh, no more than that. Just really grateful that, especially for the lessons, how they build on each other. I just, I just think that's further proof that this church is on the the right track and the right place to be. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Question two. Who were the scribes, and why did they feel it was their right to question the disciples? I like, like, I'm sorry. No, you go ahead. Okay. Well, like, pretty similar, like today, these were people that had uh, studied the law and Moses and all these writings, and they felt um, that they had the right to question what Jesus was um, was uh, showing. And um, it's, it's just the same thing today, people that have abolished and accumulated degrees, and they feel they have the right to question uh, uh, other people that have... <laughs> you know, less education or less opportunity. Um, these scribes were uh, very much immersed, uh, immersed in the in the um, law, and they thought they knew everything. Yeah, these were the students of the Pharisees. They were the Ivy League graduates of the time, mm-hmm. or the Principia graduates, however you want to look at it. <laughs> Well, they were also the people who who read in the synagogues and stuff like that. They had, you know, they had a they had the right degrees, and they had the uh, high positions within the synagogue. I think they're simply the people who were prideful in their knowledge in. You can have a degree, but if you're not so prideful of what you think you know, you probably will use it for something better than all that pride. I know you don't know kind of attitude. Yep. I read in three uh, commentaries that they saw this as an opportunity when the master was on the mount. He was on the mountain and the, uh, it was in the night, and a lot of people were at the, at the bottom waiting and they saw an opportunity because of what you all just said to take advantage and try to disprove what the Christ was doing. And then he came down. It's an illustration of the malice of the human mind, the elevated human mind, so to speak. Because these, these scribes, you know, they had custody of the written law, which was like basically the Old Testament. But they also took upon themselves the privilege of interpreting it to, in their minds, help people resolve things. But it was a literal interpretation and a human interpretation. 
and devoted to spirit and God and love, which is the fulfilling of the law that we read earlier today. And they saw Christ as competition. They don't want competition. Yeah, they, it was even more than that, wasn't it? They saw Christ as a threat. Yes. So they couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't harm Jesus. They couldn't attack him. So they went after his support. Which, which error will always do? Which error is doing today? Yeah. They can't, if they can't get to one, it'll go, it'll go to the support, try to destroy that if it, if it can. Um, it was interesting, a commentary I read, I mean, scribe, you know, someone who's writing things down. And the first scribes in the, in the Old Testament, they wrote, they were writing down Moses and other people, what they were starting the Bible in the Old Testament. And they were very dedicated, very serious scribes, copied and recopied, and made the Bible available. And then there were the prophets, they were also, some of them considered scribes because they were writing down the Word of God. Um, and then in the New Testament, uh, what made it, turned it into something other than something good was what Lauren said about their pride and their attitude, their know-it-all. Also, perhaps a lot of what they had was just handed down to them if they hadn't earned it, like third, fourth, fifth, <laughs> tenth generation where they were just totally obeying uh, this human law. And Jesus condemned them for their hypocrisy. Said that they, they stated their goal was to preserve the word, but they actually nullified it by tradition, man-made tradition. And they repla was replacing a life of godliness. And so they were insisting on all these man-made traditions that had no meaning for anyone. And it was replacing being loving, compassionate, honest, good, forthright. Shows what happens over and over and over again when the human mind takes over. Of course, that's not happening today anymore, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one thing that came up to, came to me is that this, the scribes and the Pharisees were the uh, really religious authorities of the time, and what an interesting contrast with um, Jesus' authority over the child's malady. Very good. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I mean, here was a here was a people that started out, uh, you know, with a, a, a divine purpose. You know, throughout, you know, Moses and, and the beginning of the Jewish nation, it had a divine purpose. And, and, and God warned them several times, you know, if you're faithful to me, I'll take care of you. But if you're not, you know, then look out. <laughs> and they had humanized their, what they thought was their divine purpose. They, they became a human organization instead of a divine, or instead of being divinely led. And it became a big human organization, more of a political than a religious organization. And haven't we seen that with other, and we've seen that with the Christian Science Movement? It started out as something wonderful. And then the human mind creeped in and built a big human organization. And it attracted people with ambition and pride instead of humility and love. And along comes Jesus with divine authority. Something I found on Bible.com when looking up about the scribes, it says, in Christianity, the quote, learned, have 
always been influential, and with that influence comes authority. This can be very good. The church desperately needs spiritual leaders who are biblical scholars. Unfortunately, such learning can be more of a hindrance than a help. Bible scholarship can be weak and ineffectual. It can also be dishonest and destructive. Much of the Christian faith is simply an embarrassment to many. The world of biblical scholarship is filled with theological cowards. One can only wonder how the modern scholars would compare to the ancient scribes' opposition to Jesus and his claims. Wow. <laughs> Well, that's pretty good to read that one. There you have it. (laughs) (laughs) Theological cowards. Theological cowards. (laughs) If you go down to, go ahead. I just was going to say, it it is fascinating to me. As I learn more about the Bible and, like, concurrently learn more about the, the Boston organization, how it's very similar. The the people that oppose Jesus, it will, you know, with those with the rank. It's the same mentality that I gather from Boston. So I just I find that interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Who who did Jesus meet with? You know, the up in the mount in the transfiguration. Moses, Moses and Elijah. Elijah. Yeah, Moses and Elijah. Who, who, who were also divinely authorized by God, who earned their position. You think if the scribes knew who it was that Jesus had just talked to, they wouldn't have been so brazen. <laughs> Moses and Elijah are considered like one of the, the chiefs in the, the whole Jewish movement there. Yeah, and yet, did they understand what Moses and and Elijah had given them? If they really understood it, they would have embraced Jesus instead of hating him. I mean, that's what he told them, didn't it? I was just going to say one commentary stated that the scribes felt their interpretation of the Ten Commandments was uh, more appropriate than the Ten Commandments themselves. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, what else? (laughs) People get very much enamored with their own Yes, shall I say. <laughs> and that, that's, the, that's the danger of academia. They get very enamored, and, and they have not gone through the school of hard knocks where they haven't had to apply. You know, they're just reading and talking and um, expontiating. Just um, rather than having to live it and prove it, and then they have the nerve to lecture to those who are having to live it and prove it. And this certainly happens in politics as well. It happens in every... Everywhere. Everywhere, yes. So they get very puffed up with what they think they know. And that's why they... Have, they uh, yeah, Jesus rebuked it. You have to. Someone told me, someone who had had audience with Adelaide Still in her latter years, that um, that Mrs. Eddy it was really almost the last ten years that Mrs. Eddy was just coming up against such opposition. Um, yes, in the organization, but even Adelaide Still that she heard even Calvin Fry, who was, I, I know he was weary too, but telling Mrs. Eddy if she guess got rid of the communion someday or something, that she would just be destroying her church. And so she she was being attacked 
by the human mind for a long time. And finally she laughed and realized that we would just have to figure it out ourselves, which is what's happening. And, and see what's happening and see the attack of the human mind. Because when you think of those good people that were excommunicated, that did wonderful healing work and lived the truth, it just shows that the human mind will murder the prophet. Will murder the prophet, yeah. Well, it tried. But they still went on, and they still performed wonderful healings and had followings, so. And yet, no for and, and today, we are so privileged, thank God. I mean, we have, you can have class instruction from Martha Wilcox, from Big Bell Young, from Kimball, from Carpenter, through their Eustace. books, their writings. Eustace. Eustace, yes. Yes, and thanks to you, we can do it every single day. Yes, thank, thank God. And what greater teachers could there ever be than those who were taught by Mrs. Eddy? And of course, of course, mainly being, yeah, being taught by Mrs. Eddy directly. And that is why we study so faithfully her work, chronologically, not just reading the lesson quickly, every morning, but really get into, get into her work so we have a deeper understanding of them and can prove this science for ourselves and for others. And along that, those lines, I, you know, the scribes that were questioning Jesus' disciples did not see Jesus correctly, did they? No, obviously not. They did not appreciate who he was and what he was doing. They did not appreciate his role in biblical history and prophecy. He was prophesied. They didn't see it. Same thing is happening today. There are those who say they follow who are Christian scientists, but who do not see Mrs. Eddy correctly who do not see her as the woman in the apocalypse. I, I have gotten back into the Smiley book, um, Mary Baker Eddy and her remnant seed. And over and over and over again, this, you know, he will we'll talk about it more at the round table, <clears throat> but this is a large downfall of the, of the church with their humanization and their refusal to see her as the woman in the apocalypse and the effects that that has. And also, he really goes after Robert Peel and his three books, so-called biographies of Mrs. Eddy. She, you, you can just take on any, any page, they're just examples of how he humanized her and made you doubt her divine destiny and what she truly is. And so then you say, okay, well, that's the authorized biography, and those are the ones that everybody reads. And then they get this humanized sense of her. And so the organization goes on a downward spiral, and it is happening perhaps faster than we realize. They do a great cover-up job, but it is going on, and so we must be prepared. Um, so... But that's a, a very important point. Again, not seeing her correctly. She wasn't just some nice little lady who, did, who formed a nice religion and it's all very pleasant. And of course, I am preaching to the choir because I know you all know that. But, but our watch tonight is going to be from the Smiley book and it's about this and how we must be working on this every day to know that the world does see her right. Because I, I know most of you know there's been a, atrocious things that are on the on the website websites about her. And they have to be nullified as as lies. And we can do it. We're given the responsibility to do it and we can do it and we will do it. It's ours to do. 
it's amazing to me to see how how truly stupid the human mind is that they would do their best to profit off of everything she did and at the same time say that she wasn't really that great. <laughs> it's just really, really dumb. So it's the human mind. It's the impersonal attack on the truth. And the, and the reason the human mind does that is because the human mind knows that the truth is, means the destruction of the human mind. And just in case for those of you who don't know who Adelaide still was, she she worked in Mrs. Eddie's home for many years. She was her, one of her maids, and she came over from England at a young age. And so she stayed at Chestnut Hill after Mrs. Eddie passed on, and then she lived near the, at that time, the church center. And I guess she did see a few people and would talk to a few people who were interested and speaking with her and her experiences in Mrs. Eddie's home. Okay. And, well, at the end of Chapter 9 that we're using now, um, 42 to 50, Jesus says at 42, And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone be hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. And then Mrs. Eddy also makes reference to this in miscellaneous writings on 122. She's talking about, he's talking about, quote, whom God foreordained and predestined to fulfill a divine decree. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. For anyone, and then that was the end quote of that, but she the sense of this opposition, and I think he was addressing it. I never thought of it before until we looked at this chapter closer. And he was given yeah. a treatment there yeah. and a warning. Absolutely. I think that goes along with how Revelation ends, that whoever adds or takes away from the book will have that uh, ending also. Yeah, there's a price to pay, isn't yeah. How can you not your tampering with something too holy? I mean, uh, right. And if anybody ever asks why is there no healing in a lot of the branch churches, that is the answer. Smiley makes it very plain where he says that, you know, because they do not recognize her as a woman in the apocalypse, it has taken the ability to heal. The recognition that she deserves is so very important. And he, he, he brings up case after case after case of, of why it is absolutely true. Not that any of us here, I mean, I, I never would even question that, but evidently many people do. So it's really a, it's a good book to get into. It's He made a strong case. <clears throat> Mrs. Eddie had to deal with that in, wasn't it Chicago? Where they had run into some problems with actually being able to heal? Yes. Yeah. But in the contingent of practitioners from Chicago went to Mrs. Eddie and to ask her about it. And what was her answer? To love her more. And to love me more. Yes. And when she did that, the healing resumed. And and I think Kimball, that was in the early days of Kimball, he was part of that. So. Yes, and during that time, they were up against Gestafield and Hopkins, just to clarify that, because sometimes they like to point out that it's the Kimball School from Chicago and make that look negative, when actually they were under great opposition during that time with yes, Gestafield and, and Hopkins. Yes, and that's the the new age that we spoke about in the last liberator. They they, they turned against Mrs. Eddy, separated from her, and became new age. So, Mrs. Singletary, what what is the name of the book that you were just referencing? Called Mary Baker Eddy and her I think it's her remnant. 
received. I don't have it right at hand. It says, in defense of Mary Baker Eddy and the remnant of her seed, Paul Thank R. Smiley. Thank you. Smiley, I'm not sure. And S-M-I-L-E-Y? S-M-I-L-L-I-E. Thank you. Welcome. And, you know, we have um, some of these books at church that we, they were going to be taken at the, to the dump. Not this particular one, but another one, a biography, which also speaks a lot about it. Uh, Mrs. Eddy is the Woman in the Apocalypse by Paul Smiley. And um, we, we give them free because these books were being taken to the dump. David Keaton called called us and asked if we wanted them. So this is how wicked this whole thing is, that these books would be taken to the dump that explains why she is who she is. And so we have them here. And many of you that have come to Plainfield have gotten copies of them, of this particular biography. The other one you can... You can Google and find it on Amazon. Thank you. Also, also on eBay. On eBay, thank you. Go ahead, Jeremy. Question three. What is the significance of the man asking, help thou mine unbelief? Well, in this case, Jesus questioned the man and asked how long ago it was since this came on the child. And then he gave the father an instruction. And the father was weeping when he said, with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. You just imagine that moment. Mrs. Eddie's uh, talks about this and things and help them. Yes. Yes. Anybody know what she says about it? About being Two trustworthy. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Two types of faith. Trustfulness and trustworthiness. One kind of faith trusts one welfare to others. Another kind of faith understands divine love and how to work out one's own salvation with fear and trembling. Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief, expresses the helplessness of a blind faith, whereas the injunction, believe and thou shalt be saved, demands self-reliant trustworthiness, which includes spiritual understanding and confines, confides all to God. Thank you. Thank you. Powerful to work with. And, you know, and also in the glossary, Mrs. Eddy, her definition of believing, firmness and constancy, not a faltering nor a blind faith, but the perception of spiritual truth and then mortal thought solution. But remember that the perception of spiritual truth, that is, that's what it is to believe. This poor fellow knew there was something, but he didn't know what to believe in. He needed help from someone who did, and he admitted it. He knew he was doing the best he could, but he did need help. Yeah, unlike the scribes who thought they knew it all. It was interesting. Spurgeon says, nobody but Jesus, but Christ Jesus can get rid of your unbelief. Confess it as a sin and ask him to enable you to get rid of unbelief. But that was interesting and, and helpful. You confess it as a sin. And, and then he goes on to say, I mean, who, who wouldn't believe Jesus? I mean, think of all the things Jesus has said. And done. And done. And yet, and yet we still don't believe it. What's the matter with us? You're not counting <laughs> the blessings. <laughs> yes. 
So if you feel if you could cry out, help thou my unbelief, ask, ask the Christ to help you with it. Realize that it, it is a sin not to not to trust him. Not to you think he's lying? Virgin brings that out. I thought it was such a good point. You think Jesus is lying when he says all the wonderful things and does all these healings? You think that's just a big lie? Or do you do you trust it? Do you believe it? Do you have that perception? And it was also it, it brought out the the man said, If thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us and Jesus turned around Turn that around and say, if thou canst believe, call <laughs> yes. me. So he's saying, he was had this if. If you, if you can do it, can you do it? And Jesus turned it around and said, can you have the faith? If, mm-hmm. if, if. So it's a duet. It's not all, all of the practitioner. It's not all the patient. It's a, it's a combination and if someone has the stone wall up and doesn't believe in it at all, it makes it much more difficult to break that wall down. So, there's deep lessons in this story, and we can benefit from them. And then like I'm sorry. Jesus turned and said, when, when they couldn't cast them out, the disciples, all the disciples who had been with him, who being so many healing. O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? So, that wasn't so nice, oh, you poor dears, you need my help. <laughs> he, he gave it to them. And they needed it. Faithless generation. God forbid we be called that individually or collectively, so we can all work harder on our on our belief in asking God to help us, the Christ to help us with any unbelief we might have, all these doubts that we harbor sometimes. It's an offense. It's a sin, really. So. It is. It is. And I, it's helpful to see. It's always been helpful to me. I, I, I did so many things I didn't realize were sin. You know, I thought if I didn't kill anybody and if I didn't, you know, that was sinning. Um, but I didn't realize that unbelief was a sin. I didn't realize that negativity is a sin. Fear is a sin. All of those things. Uh, jealousy, competition, pride. And what and what and what is another word for sin? Anything on God. Anything opposed to God. Right. Oh, it's error. Error, mistake. I mean, you know, it's not like. Sin is something you have to condemn yourself for, necessarily. It's a mistake. In this case, it's it's. You have to correct it. Yeah. Well, you do have to acknowledge it as a sin, and if you if you work with common purpose, you certainly see that, because too many scientists don't see it as it, and or think it make too light of it, and you have to see it. And, and in order to repent, to loathe it, and to realize it is not part of you, to thoroughly get rid of it. Not make a big reality of it either, but it must be, in order to be repented of, it has to be acknowledged. And that's true, of, and that's true with any mistake. It has to be acknowledged as a mistake if you want to learn from it. If you don't acknowledge a mistake, you'll never learn from it. And then you can know that there are no mistakes in mind and that it's no part of you, and then you get into the absolute of it and thoroughly dispose of it 
and, and so there's no trace of it left. And that requires the humility to acknowledge the mistake or the sin in the first place. And the deep repentance of it and wanting to really separate self, the true self, from it. Exactly. That way you're honestly going up the, the ladder and offending and clarifying your thoughts and dropping the old for the new and having this transformation from the human to the divine. It's an honest progression. You're not just stating you're sinless and a child of God and, <laughs> and yet doing all kinds of things that are are thinking all kinds of things that are sin, which is what I did, which is, and we ever must be on guard about it, not knowing that that was my problem and that's why I was not making progress in science. I just would jump to the absolute statement and not realize I needed to examine my own heart and get rid of all that is unlike God, Mrs. Eddy said. Anyone else? Jeremy, what do you want? Do you want to say something? Oh, uh, I just when I was reading this, just the fact that he asked that, realizing you know <laughs> he was in such a low place, he wasn't just begging for the healing. He wanted more than that. I just I found that to be quite profound, and also the thought that. Really, every every morning when I open up the lesson and come, whenever I come here and everything, it, it, it's still me in a way saying that, oh, my unbelief. Well, that, that keeps that, you in a very humble that's wonderful. place. And, you know, it, it was interesting, too, that it did, as Lawrence was saying earlier, this, this problem got worse before it got better. And... Uh, and Jesus didn't say, oh, no, why, oh my gosh, what's going on? <laughs> but he, he so clearly knew the nothing, nothingness of it, that he stood and, and, and he rebuked, because this was, would appear to be a devil. That's why we're to cast out devils. Just some very aggressive mental suggestion that would try to take over this child that was going unrebuked. People were afraid of it. He was able to rebuke it, and the child was set free. I think that's a really good lesson. I forgot about that part because I had read somewhere that, you know, the disciples had cast out dev devils before because they even have it documented in the Bible, you know, we cast out demons in your name, but this one they could not, and it was very mesmeric, and that was a good lesson for those of us who find ourselves being very mesmerized, Ben, I think you just helped by saying that it had been gone on so long, and uh, it seemed very aggressive. Yes, yeah. and that's why it's always good, you know, to catch things early on before they go on and on and it seems so real, and it's always in belief. Um, but, uh, you know, people who just won't get help from a practitioner, they wait, they wait, they wait, they wait, they wait, they wait, until everything is wrong in their life. And then they nice and neatly present it on the practitioner's lap. That's <laughs> like, thanks a lot. <laughs> you know, and you could have gotten help with some of these things early on. Early on, it's a lot easier to, to break that mesmeric hole. Um, Before it's been institutional. Yes, yes. No, I mean, it, 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 it's also, it's not really fair to the practitioner to wait and wait and wait. Now, some people don't have a choice or they didn't know about science, or, but when you've been here a while and, and you just don't get help when you really need it, it's much better to get that help and keep your slate clear. Why? Why?
What are you to Error do? ignored grows worse. Yes, it does. But you have work to do yes. for God. Yes, mm-hmm. You don't have time to wallow in the error. Yes. That's, that's the answer here. You've got God's work to do. And, you know, who, who needs to be going through all this kind of stuff? This, this, is, this is part of the training we had with Mrs. Evans, which is why we all, many of us, got help the way we did, because we had work to do, and we did not have time to just let things go and go and go. And, and it was actually a great. People question it and wonder and think, oh, it's making you weak. Well, it didn't make us weak. It made us strong. And I'm not suggesting it for everybody, but everyone should be doing their own work and making great progress on their own. That's, that's the best answer. But if you're not, don't just wait and wait and wait. No, don't be afraid to admit your unbelief. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think we've I think I think we've started number four, haven't we? Question number four. Yeah, most definitely. <laughs> <laughs> well, question four: What lessons can be learned from how Christ Jesus dealt with this man and his son? I think we've uh, covered some of them. But certainly, compassionately. Yes, and, and strong, strong. And even at the end, what they thought that the child was dead. Jesus was not impressed. Yes, yeah, Jesus lifted him up. <laughs> he probably was like, didn't I just say a few minutes ago how you weren't a faithful generation? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Thank you. Well, he certainly he was taught about. Right. Go ahead, Go ahead. No, he also taught about faith, the importance of it. Don't, you know, hang around here just doubting. You know, he 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 admired faith everywhere that he he healed. Jesus did. Yeah. And he was impatient with the resistance of the human mm-hmm. mind to the truth. He was impatient with lack of faith. He's so right, though. I mean, how long? What else do you need to see? I mean, right? How long, oh Lord? Mhm. Well, faith is essential to any healing, really. I mean, it is, and and, and then is the perception, the perception of the truth. So, so you get a deeper understanding as to what and why you were healed, not just um, Mrs. Eddy's article in retrospection and introspection, Faith Cure, which she she talks about that and how important it is that it's not to be Faith Cure. And maybe I can find it. Someone can end on that. I was excellent. Article, excellent chapter in retrospection and introspection, and I am coming upon it now. So, Gary, you can read it. Okay. Faith cure. It is often asked why are faith cures sometimes more speedy than some of the cures wrought through Christian scientists. Because faith is belief and not understanding, and it is easier to believe than to understand spiritual truth. It demands less cross-bearing, self-renunciation, and divine science to admit the claims of the corporeal senses and appeal to God for relief through a humanized conception of his power than to deny these claims and learn the divine way, drinking Jesus' cup, being baptized with his baptism, gaining the end through persecution and purity. Millions are believing in God or good 
without bearing the fruits of goodness, not having reached its science. Belief is virtually blindness when it admits truth without understanding it. Blind belief cannot say with the apostle, I know whom I have believed. There is danger in this mental state called belief, for if truth is admitted but not understood, it may be lost. And error may enter through this same channel of ignorant belief. The faith cure has devout followers whose Christian practice is far in advance of their theory. The work of healing in the science of mind is the most sacred and salutary power which can be wielded. My Christian students, impressed with the true sense of the great work before them, enter this straight and narrow path and work conscientiously. Let us follow the example of Jesus, the master metaphysician, and gain sufficient knowledge of error to destroy it with truth. Evil is not mastered by evil. It can only be overcome with good. This brings out the nothingness of evil and the eternal somethingness, vindicates the divine principle, and improves the race of Adam. Very important article. One to study and think about and explain that it brings you farther along this path. Yes, faith is very important. Absolutely it is. But then comes the understanding, um, and that's the real, the, the transformation of life, and that is what heals. And people that just complain and cry, I want the faith cure, I want the quick fix. Uh-uh. That might work once or twice, but... But it doesn't last. It does not last. So we all have to go up forward, go forward, and, and we all shall. So thank you, Jeremy. And thank, thank you, all. Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.